It's great to welcome back to the program today, Tom Hartman. Tom hosts the Tom Hartman program and is also author of the Hidden History series. The latest book in that series is The Hidden History of Neoliberalism, How Reaganism Gutted America and How to Restore Its Greatness. Tom, always great having you on. Thank you, David. Thanks for inviting me. So um, one of the interesting things about Reaganism is I don't think this is the first time that we can say this, but there were sort of certain stories that started to be told, which shifted the way that in large part uh, corporate and political media talked about politics. Uh, we know about the welfare queen stories. We, we know about a lot of these different stories that's overtly or sometimes not so overtly were used to shift our focus about how we should think about politics, welfare programs, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about the, the circumstances in which this shift from Keynesianism to neoliberalism took place? And if you want to also de define neoliberalism as you use the term in the book, that would be great, too. Sure. Yeah. Neoliberalism was a, a political and economic philosophy that was originated in uh, Europe in the 1940s in an effort to come up with a system, a political system that governments could use that would prevent them from ever becoming fascist or communist. This was in the wake of you know, World War II. And, uh, you know, sadly, <laughs> neoliberalism, every time it's been applied, it's been applied to a country. Um, one of two things has happened. It, I, it, first of all, it always flips the country into oligarchy, which is a very unstable political system. You and I talked about it when my book on oligarchy came out. It rarely lasts more than a generation or two. It's so unstable. And oligarchy typically either flips into fascism, uh, as it has in Russia, as it did in Iraq. And and over the short term, well, over the short term, actually, what happened in Chile was the, the other alternative, which is that it flips uh, oligarchy flips into democracy, which is what happened when they overthrew, overthrew Pinochet. So the United States now is still in this neoliberal phase, this 40 year neoliberal experiment. And we've got enormous pressures coming out of the Republican Party to turn America into a fascist state and enormous pressure from the Democratic Party to turn America into a democratic state, small d, and uh, or you could say a democratic republic. Um, the definition of neoliberalism is pretty straightforward. These guys believed that because there's billions of decisions being made in the marketplace every second. I mean, right now, there's probably a thousand people in this literally as we're speaking, choosing which brand of orange juice to buy. Um, you know, there's just billions of decisions being made in the marketplace and that they saw as a huge collective wisdom. And therefore, they said the marketplace should be defining the rules of the marketplace. And, and also the rules of governance, which traditionally define the rules of the marketplace. Now, this in and of itself is an insane idea. It's like saying, you know, if, if, I mean, the marketplace is nothing more than a game that we play that involves money, just like football is a game that we play that involves this ball made out of pigskin. And, you know, this is like saying, well, what the NFL should do is whichever team has the most money should just let them write the rules and decide how many men they can have on the field during the game and how many their competitors must have because they're in charge now. Basically, neoliberalism always leads to the rise of billionaire oligarchs and the massive consolidation of huge corporations at the expense of small communities and small businesses. So number one, low taxes cut because because the billionaires and the big corporations are the major players in the economy. They need to be encouraged because they're the Darwinian winners. So that's why we have a 3% income tax rate right now for billionaires and 30% for you and me. Um, uh, number number 10, and, and we've got two, two men now who control more than half, 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 have more wealth in the bottom half of America. Number two, uh, so-called free trade. Corporations should be free to go anywhere in the world and find the cheapest labor possible because nations don't matter to hell with nations. Although a nation should keep people within their borders, <laughs> they shouldn't keep corporations within their borders. And, uh, you know, and there, there's a bunch of corollaries to that, um, you know, that, that uh, you know, kind of derive out of those basic. Oh, and, and that labor is always an interference in the marketplace. Any labor, you know, if labor has power that distorts the marketplace because labor isn't the major player. Labor is just subordinate to management and therefore all labor unions should be destroyed. So Reagan adopted this and applied it to the United States, threw us into neoliberalism, took us out of classic Adam Smith economics, what's sometimes referred to as Keynesian economics, because John Maynard Keynes had fine-tuned it. But really, it's what 
uh, particularly in his book, A Theory of Moral Sentiments in 1784, that Adam Smith described in some detail. Before, and, uh, let, let me pause there. So before we move on into more of the history, at, now that you've kind of defined it for us, um, there are some in my audience who are uh, further to, to the left than, than I am, certainly, and, and are truly sort of bona fide socialists, and I don't use that term pejoratively, who sometimes will write to me and they'll say, you know, David, there's really not that much breathing room between neoliberalism, as you've just defined it and written about, and northern European social democracy. It's all way too far to the right for them. Can you weigh in a little bit on is there really substantive difference between what you just defined and northern European social democracy, or are they more similar maybe than some of us like to acknowledge? Well, first of all, if you compare, you know, Pinochet's Chile or Russia uh, or Iraq, where, where Nouriel Maliki has turned himself into basically you know, uh, a dictator. Um, yeah, there's some significant differences between those countries in any country in Europe. That said, uh, Margaret Thatcher was the, you know, I mean, neoliberalism was invented in the 40s. These guys pitched it aggressively through the 50s and 60s and largely were considered crackpots. And then we got the inflation of the 70s as a result of the Arab oil embargo in 73 and the fall of the Shah in 79. And that inflation uh, was the perfect uh, tool or uh, opportunity that Milton Friedman used here in the United States to pitch neoliberalism, not just here, but all around the world. He said neoliberalism will fix inflation, which hadn't even been part of the original sales pitch. But hey, you know, take opera. This is Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, right? You got a problem. We got a solution. And so uh, Margaret Thatcher was actually the first to buy it and, you know, broke the coal union, which was the strongest union in, in all of the United Kingdom. Nobody thought it was even possible in her first months in office and, 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 uh, and then, you know, privatized the railroad and did a whole bunch of other neoliberal reforms. So the UK uh, is not that far behind the United States in terms of neoliberalism. We're, we're only farther ahead because we were more li neoliberal to begin with. We didn't have a national health service. We didn't have free college. Um, you know, we didn't have the basic stuff that England has a strong, a strong, really strong welfare state. Um, so, you know, yeah, neoliberalism has infected Europe and uh, some so-called neoliberal reforms, most of them being pushed by the IMF, by the way, and being trumpeted at Davos every year by all the billionaires who show up, have crept into uh, many of the European countries, in particular France um, and, and the United Kingdom, as I just mentioned. But uh, and 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 you know, there's even a debate about neoliberalism in Sweden right now. But um, but to say that it's the same thing, no, that's that's uh, just not right. You know, one of the interesting things about uh, the replacement of Keynesianism by neoliberalism relates to this idea that Keynes had in the 30s. And if you've read anything about leisure economics or this, this always comes up. Keynes had this idea that soon we would all be working only 15 hours a week and people would have all of this leisure time because of technology and productivity, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we know it didn't happen. We know that actually the work week continued to get longer and longer. Would Keynes maybe have been right were it not for neoliberalism? Because it's so it's so discussed. That was Keynes's prediction. We know it didn't happen. There's 50 different explanations as to why is neoliberalism a part of that? Uh, to an extent, yeah. I mean, you know, look at France when when they adopted fully adopted essentially what you're calling Keynesianism after World War II. Um, you know, uh, they they were able to get legally get down to a maximum 30 hour or maybe it was 32 hour work week, as you'll recall. I mean, that was a big deal. Um, Italy adopted that, although they didn't make it law. Um, it's, it was widespread across Europe, um, you know, uh, four day weeks or shorter work days or longer lunches. Um, these are these are not uncommon, although the last decade has seen a rollback of a lot of that as as neoliberalism has been pushing hard on Europe. And I'm hopeful that this book, you know, uh, um, several of my books have been translated into, uh, I mean, Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight into 17 languages. I'm hopeful that this book can get a, an audience in Europe as well, because, you know, neoliberalism is knocking on their door pretty aggressively right now. What's the path to reversing this in the United States? Is it as simple as electing certain candidates 
based on their pursuit of particular policies or is it is it really bigger than that no that's that that's it david it's it, you know we need to re-empower labor elizabeth warren has legislation right now to do this the national right to unionize act um you know basically undoing taft hartley and 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 a whole series of neoliberal supreme court decisions um number one we need to raise taxes on the rich on the morbidly rich um, the, you know, the, like I said before, the average billionaire in America is paying three, three percent income tax. That that's wrong. And that's why you've got, you know, three men owning more wealth than the bottom half of America. And that wealth, by the way, is generally not engaged productively in the economy. They're not spending it. You know, I had a, a, a billionaire on my show and he said, you know, I, I buy, I probably own the same number of blue jeans as you do. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a hundred thousand times richer than you, but I'm not going to buy 50 pairs of blue jeans. And, uh, you know, so I'm not helping the economy anymore, you know, it's, uh, so that money really should be in the economy more broadly. Um, so we need to go back to tax rates that are above 50 percent for people making more than three or three million dollars a year is where, you know, uh, basically FDR had it in today's dollars. And and we need to undo so-called free trade. We need to stop corporations from the arbitrage of trade of uh, labor. They, we need to say labor. You know, the products sold in the United States should be made in the United States. And there's a variety of ways to do that that were laid out by Alexander Hamilton in 1793, the Congress adopted, and that were U.S. policy. We had an industrial policy, literally from the George Washington administration to the Ronald Reagan administration. And Reagan blew all that up and Clinton doubled down on it. Uh, one of the uh, kind of pillars of support for uh, neoliberal policies, even if people don't necessarily know the term neoliberalism, you can talk to them about policies like lower taxes for businesses, for example, and, and they support these things. A lot of this is based on fundamental misunderstandings of, of sort of like how things work. And I'll give one example of that. You often hear repeated, oh, we need to lower taxes to encourage businesses to make investments. Well, business uh, expenses are tax deductible. So actually, a higher tax rate is more of an incentive to reinvest because you are avoiding a higher tax rate by making tax deductible investments in your business. It's just a basic thing about how taxes work. Brilliantly pointed out. What, what do you make of the fact that these fundamental realities are turned completely around to gain support of these policies? Is it as simple as educating people? I think so. I, I really do. I, you know, and and uh, that's why I wrote the book. Um, you know, and I'm hoping it's going to be a, a fascinating starting point for a lot of people's conversations because neoliberalism has gutted America. When Ronald Reagan came into office, 65 percent of America was in the middle class. Now it's down to 45 percent. And of that 45 percent, it's no longer possible to stay in the middle class with a single wage earner in the family. Um, you know, and it's no longer possible to stay out of debt for, for at least half of that 45 percent. They're living on credit card debt, mortgage debt, student debt. Um, you know, America has more personal debt than we've ever had in the history of, the, of this country, more corporate debt than we've ever had, and obviously more government debt. None of those are healthy things for an economy. All of those are the direct products of neoliberalism. What do you see as the role of technology in what may or may not be a shift away from neoliberalism, kind of in the context of uh, not too long ago, I read Neil Postman's book Technopoly written in the early 90s, where he's not taking an agnostic view about technology, but he's essentially saying in terms of how it affects economies, culture, et cetera, you're going to get the pros and the cons. And it's really about management and regulation and not about suppressing a technology, which he argued is is more or less inevitable. How does modern technology, social media, et cetera, impact the culture around our economic systems and things like the future of neoliberalism? Well, it Technology itself, I mean, this this is not an area where the Luddites would jump in and say, hooray, this is our cause. Uh, you know, technology itself is kind of agnostic with regard to neoliberalism and vice versa. However, social media, ha you know, I mean, more than half of Americans now get their news primarily from Facebook. Yeah. Pretty damn shocking. Social media is a relatively cheap place to, to spread a message. And neoliberalism has made a small number of people and a small number of corporations mind-bogglingly rich. I mean, richer than the pharaohs, richer than any king or kingdom in the history of the world 
Uh, the British royal family, at, at, you know, being worth $14 billion, are pikers. They're a joke compared to some of the billionaires in the United States. So these guys pouring millions of dollars into ads and trolls and professional bloggers, as it were, on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on, I mean, you, you name it, TikTok. Um, this has been going on for some time and will continue to go on. They may not have hired these people to say, hey, you're going to promote neoliberalism. It's, it tends to be more focused. You're going to be the guy who's, you know, the Grover Norquist who's going to talk about never raising taxes on billionaires. And you're going to be the guy who talks about how evil unions are and blah, blah, blah. And you're going to be the guy who talks about how we've got to have free trade or, you know, else the world is going to collapse or et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, to the extent that technology plays a role in this, it's, it's largely limited to the role of propaganda. Is neoliberal neoliberalism self-reinforcing in the sense that by its very nature, it puts many people in a position of not being able to take a day off from work because they can't afford to lose the wages, their health insurance is at risk in order to protest the very system that created those conditions. And at that in that sense, it reinforces itself. Yeah. And not only that, it follows on the uh, the opinions and goals of the early advocates of neoliberalism, particularly Barry Goldwater and William F. Buckley. Back in 1951, Russell Kirk wrote this book, The Conservative Mind. I write about this in my book on oligarchy. And he suggested and uh, that, you know, the, the American middle class was growing too fast. In 51, you know, we were, our middle class was larger than any in the world. It was growing really, really rapidly. It was still only 20, 30% of Americans, but it was growing. It was growing faster than rich people were getting rich. And, and he wrote that at a certain point, the middle class is going to be large enough and, and people are going to be uh, no longer afraid of poverty enough that you're going to see three consequences. Young people are going to start defying their elders, which will produce social chaos. Women are, are going to forget that their, their primary place is in the, in the kitchen and the bedroom, which is going to create social chaos. And minorities are going to forget that they have a place in society at the bottom. They're supposed to be the maids and the janitors. And that's going to cause social chaos when, when they start demanding you know, access to the boardroom and media and things. Um, he didn't explicitly lay it out quite like that. Many of his followers did. But he, he, he established the frame in that book. And, you know, at the time in 61, in 51, when he proposed this, everybody thought he was a crackpot, except for Buckley and Goldwater. But by the time, you know, 1967 rolled around and, you know, young people like me at that time were burning our draft cards. Women were burning their bras. And this went uh, you know, doubled down in 72 when the Supreme Court legalized birth control and 73 when they legalized abortion, women demanding access to the workplace. And of course, the civil rights movement was really, you know, roaring in the 60s and 70s. And at that point, Republicans started looking around going, holy crap, Russell Kirk was right. And so part of Reagan's mandate when he came into office, when the middle class was 65 percent of America and was defying the power, openly defying the power structures of this country was to cut the middle class down to size. And neoliberalism was the perfect tool to do that. And that's exactly what happened, as I mentioned. You know, our middle class is no longer the middle. It's, you know, it's, it's no longer 65% of America. It's 45% of America. And it's in debt as it is. So those students have shut up because they're in debt. The, the women are, you know, right now in a pitched battle <laughs> you know, over abortion specifically, but yep. over women's rights more generally. And the civil rights movement rolls on, too. And, and we're seeing all the pushback against that in right wing channels like Fox News. We've been speaking about Tom Hartman's latest book, The Hidden History of Neoliberalism, how Reaganism gutted America and how to restore its greatness. Tom, always appreciate your time and your insights. Thank you, David. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be on your program. I really appreciate you inviting me. Thank you.